Buenas tardes, eh, señoras y señores. Mi nombre es Francisco Pradas, investigador del Instituto de Física Teórica de la Universidad Autónoma de Madrid y del CSIC. Y es un placer esta tarde presentaros al profesor Simon White, eh, director del prestigioso Instituto Max Planck de Astronomía de Múnich, Alemania, desde el año 1994. Eh, Simon inició su carrera investigador en Cambridge con un doctorado dirigido por el profesor Donald Lindenberg sobre la formación de cúmulos de galaxias. El profesor White ha recibido numerosos eh, premios y reconocimientos a lo largo de su extensa carrera, algunos de ellos muy prestigiosos, como la medalla de oro de la Royal Astronomical Society, el doctorado honoris causa por la Universidad de Durham y eh, recientemente el premio de la Fundación Gruber en Cosmología en el año 2011, junto con sus colegas Mark Davis, uh, George Eftasio y Carlos Frank, con quienes trabajó durante los años 80 en la Universidad de California en Berkeley. Por este trabajo, el cual recibió este premio, permitió validar la teoría de la materia oscura fría para entender la formación y crecimiento, <coughs> perdón, y crecimiento de estructuras en el universo. Este trabajo también demostró el poder de las simulaciones cosmológicas como herramienta para contrastar las teorías con las observaciones. Hoy en día, prácticamente en astronomía, en cosmología, todos los campos usan estas simulaciones cosmológicas eh, que son una herramienta fundamental para el estudio del universo, en particular para el estudio de su origen, de su evolución, para ver cómo se forman las estrellas, las galaxias y finalmente los, los planetas, eh, como es el caso de la Tierra. La, esta materia oscura fría es un componente esencial en nuestro universo y su presencia es fundamental para entender el proceso de formación de estructuras y de galaxias. El profesor White ha participado también activamente en la misión espacial Planck, que recientemente seguramente habéis podido comprobar los resultados que ha difundido la prensa, donde se ha demostrado que esas simulaciones eh, que inicialmente fueron las que predecían la formación de estructura que vemos en la actualidad, pues son realmente útiles para explicar y consolidar el modelo cosmológico estándar. He estado pensando en algunas palabras para describir su trabajo, enumerando muchas de sus contribuciones en las revistas más prestigiosas a nivel internacional, eh, pero eh, quizás he pensado en algo más eh, sostenible, algo que perdure en el tiempo y que describa el trabajo de Simon en el futuro. Y creo que lo podemos describir como un pionero en la teoría de la materia oscura fría que explica la formación de estructura y galaxias en el universo. Finalmente, me gustaría destacar también eh, su legado académico como profesor. Eh, Simon ha dado clases tanto en la Universidad de California en Berkeley en Arizona, donde también fue profesor, y en la Universidad de Cambridge, y por supuesto en el Instituto Max Planck, de donde actualmente pues, eh, realiza su trabajo desde el año 1994, como antes he dicho. En total ha dirigido 35 tesis doctoral, doctorales, que como podéis imaginar, pues, es un legado enorme. En la actualidad, su investigación se centra en simular la formación de galaxias en el universo, tal como lo entendemos a día de hoy, un universo dominado por energía y materia oscura. Hoy nos va a hablar del origen de las galaxias y sin más doy paso al profesor White. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Paco. Señoras y señores, no hablo español. <laughs> so I'm afraid I will have to speak to you in English. What I want to do today 
is to tell you a story about the origin of all structure in our universe, how our universe began and how it came to take the form that we see around us today. So if you like, this is a kind of modern creation myth. So the title of my lecture is The Origin of the Galaxies. So this, I suppose, you have seen before. This is our world. This is, until very recently, the only place we had ever been. And not very many of us have ever been anywhere else. It is made on the surface of rock and water. Rock and water are made of atoms. Everything we know, the table, our bodies, the air, is made of atoms. But it turns out that most of the universe is not made of atoms. So this picture was taken from satellites. Satellites circling 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth with cameras pointing down, taking pictures. You put all the pictures together, you have a mosaic, a map of the surface of the Earth. If you turn the cameras round and look out, you can make a mosaic of the sky. And this is what it looks like. This is the whole sky. This is the Milky Way. The Milky Way is our own galaxy, the galaxy that we live in. It is made of about 10 billion stars. You can see the Milky Way if you go somewhere on a dark night, perhaps not in Madrid. The lights are too bright. But if you go outside Madrid into the mountains on a dark night and you look up, you can easily see the Milky Way crossing the sky. And all the stars you see here, many of them you can see. And even some of the bright stars are quite far away. You can see many of the stars here the brighter ones are 10,000 light years away. That means that the light from the star took 10,000 years to reach your eye. So what you see is not the star as it is today, but the star as it was 10,000 years ago, before the beginning of recorded history on Earth. So you are looking directly into the past. Here is another picture of our own Milky Way. This is again the whole sky, and this is at longer wavelengths, infrared wavelengths. So this was made with a special camera in space. And now again you can see the Milky Way here, and you can see better this region, which is the central part of our own galaxy. And this is 30,000 light years away. So what you see in this image is the central part of our own galaxy, not as it is today, but as it was 30,000 years ago, when the Neanderthals were roaming in Europe. You can see, though, much further away. If we go back here, just here, and also here, but Look at this one, there's a small splodge, a small patch of light, which is not a single star. If you take this small patch right there, which you can see with your naked eye, if you know where to look, and take a picture, you find it is the Andromeda Nebula. It is another galaxy like our own. So when you look up from the mountains, and you, you see Andromeda, with your own eye, without even a telescope, you are seeing another galaxy. And it is two million light years away. So you are seeing back in time two million years. 
So you're seeing back to the beginnings of human history, to the time before Homo sapiens took his present form. So you're seeing very far into the past. This is what's called a spiral galaxy, and it's quite similar to our own galaxy. Many galaxies look like this. This is a disk of stars, and it was rotating around the center. So in the previous picture, you have to imagine the sun is here somewhere, out towards the edge, and we're inside this disk. And because we're inside it, it looks very thin. So this is our own galaxy. If you could move out of our galaxy and look down upon it, it would look like this. And it takes the sun 100 million years to go all the way around. But that's only about 1% of the age of the universe. So the galaxy has turned around 100 times in the age of the universe. So that you've now seen three galaxies, our own galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, actually there are two small galaxies here, and this one. There are many, many galaxies out there. This is another map of the sky, but every point of light here is a galaxy. In this picture, there are two million galaxies. And you can see in every direction on the sky, there are galaxies. But you can also see that in some directions, there are many galaxies. And in other directions, there are few galaxies. The galaxies are arranged in a pattern, which we call the large-scale structure of the universe. So they do not fill space at random, but they like to meet each other in these objects, which are called galaxy clusters. So you can think of space being filled with galaxies, but these galaxies are arranged in this pattern. So the most distant galaxy here is one billion light years away, 1,000 million light years away. So that means we see that galaxy not as it is today, but as it was one billion years ago, before life came out of the oceans on Earth. So we're now looking far back into the past. But we can look even further. This is the deepest optical photograph of the sky that was ever taken. To make this picture, the Hubble Space Telescope pointed in the same direction and exposed for 300 hours. So you're used to taking a photograph for 1 30th of a second. This is a camera with a lens two meters wide and it took an exposure of 300 hours. So these are very faint objects. This is a, a very small patch of the sky. This is a, a small fraction of the size of the moon. But you can see that even in this small patch of the sky, there are many galaxies. You can see this one is a spiral galaxy. Here's a spiral galaxy. Here's a spiral galaxy. These are all galaxies. And now we're looking back even further. The most distant galaxies here, which are very faint patches you can barely see, are so far away that the light has been traveling from them to us for most of the age of the universe. So we see them at a time when the whole universe was much younger than it is today. And today, because the universe has continued to grow, those galaxies are 30 billion light years away. So you can see we are now seeing very far back into the past. So the question is, how far can we see? We can see back in time. Can we see to the beginning? Or how close can we see to the beginning? And it turns out that it is possible to see much closer to the beginning. But to do that, you have to look at a different wavelength. And this was first done by this satellite called COBE. It's a NASA satellite. 
and it flew for four years. And it flew above the Earth's atmosphere and looked out away from the Earth. And it observed the sky at microwave wavelengths. So microwaves are light with a wavelength of about one millimeter. So that's similar to the waves in a microwave oven that heat your food. And those waves do not penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. So if you want to make a picture of the sky in the microwaves, you have to do this from space. So Kobe flew for four years. It had two instruments which made a picture of the whole sky. One of them was at infrared wavelengths, and I already showed you that picture. That was the picture of our galaxy at infrared wavelengths. The other instrument made a picture of the sky at microwave wavelengths, and a third instrument made a spectrum of the sky, which I will not talk about today. So they observed the picture of the sky for four years, and finally we had a picture of what the sky looks like in microwaves, and it was so beautiful that they got the Nobel Prize in 2006 for physics. So let me show you the picture of the sky in microwaves. It looks like this. So the intensity of the sky, the brightness in microwaves, is measured by a temperature. So where there's more microwaves, it's hotter. Where there are fewer microwaves, it's colder. The average temperature of the sky is 2.728 degrees above absolute zero. So this room is 300 degrees above absolute zero. So this is 100 times colder. But it's not zero. And the contrast in this picture is one-tenth of one degree. So where it is blue, it is one-tenth of a degree colder. And where it is red, it is one-tenth of a degree hotter. And what you see, if you look closely, is nothing. Why? That is because, at this contrast, the sky is the same temperature in all directions. So this is a difference of only 3%, but you still do not see anything. It is very nearly uniform. To see anything, you have to increase the contrast. So let me increase the contrast by a factor of 30. So now, where it is blue, it is three one-thousandths of a degree colder, and where it is red, it is three one-thousandths of a degree hotter. So there's a very slight variation from one side of the sky to the other side of the sky, by one part in one thousand. What you can see is there's this smooth variation, and there's something else underneath it. So if you take away the smooth variation, and you increase the contrast by another factor of more than 100, you get this picture. So now the difference between the coldest point here and the hottest point here is one part in 100,000. So it is up here, the temperature is very nearly the same, but not exactly the same. There are small differences. So let me explain what has been seen. The pattern here that you see is the reflection of the motion of our galaxy through the universe as a whole. What is happening is in this particular direction where it is hot, that is the direction we are moving towards. The opposite direction where it is cold is the direction we are moving away from. And the difference in temperature is what is known as the Doppler effect. It's the same effect that changes the pitch of an ambulance as it passes you. As it comes towards you, the pitch is higher. Dee, 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 dee. And as it passes you and goes away, it lowers. Dee, 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 dee. So because it's cut, we're going in towards the sky here, the pitch is higher, the, the wavelength is shorter, and it looks hotter. In the opposite direction, we're moving away, it looks colder. So this allows us to measure the speed of our galaxy through the cosmos as a whole. And it's moving in this particular direction at about 600 kilometers per second. 
through the universe as a whole. So when you take that pattern away, what you see next is this band. This is radiation from material inside our own galaxy. It's radiation from the material between the stars. So this is interesting, but I don't want to talk about it anymore today. What I want to talk about is what you see outside our galaxy, away from where the stars are. And this is structure in what's called the microwave background, which is this radiation itself. So the question is, what is this structure and what are we seeing? And this radiation is the leftover heat from the Big Bang itself. So what we're seeing is structure in the leftover radiation that has come to us from the first instance of creation. So we can ask a number of questions. The first question to ask is where is the structure? So today when I arrived, the sun had not yet come out. I thought Spain, the sun always shone. But today in Madrid, the sky was gray. When you look up, the sky is gray, but it's not the same color gray in all directions. Some directions are brighter, some are darker. You see structure in the sky. That structure is structure in the clouds. Because the sunlight hits the clouds, is scattered inside the clouds, and then comes directly to us beneath the clouds because the air under the clouds is transparent. So when you look up, you see the structure in the clouds. The structure we see in the microwaves is exactly the same. Today's universe is transparent to microwaves. So we see back, back, back in time to the point where the universe is no longer transparent and then we see structure in those cosmic clouds. And these clouds are the far edge, the boundary, the limit of the visible universe. And that is because no light, all light is scattered, so we cannot see past them. So everything visible that you can make a picture of must lie in front of these clouds. So this is an image we're seeing of the edge, the boundary of our visible universe. Well, you could say, it doesn't look very interesting. What is it we're actually seeing? What is this structure? Well, it turns out at this time, the universe was nearly uniform. It was filled with gas. And what you're seeing is small variations in the density and the temperature of the gas at that time. So that's exactly the same as what you're hearing at the moment. If you took off your headphones and you hear, you hear sound going through the air in this room, the sound is small changes in the density and the temperature of the air, small fluctuations. So what we are seeing here is the same phenomenon, but now very far away in space and time in these clouds. These small variations are sound waves propagating through the clouds. 